Gumba Balga and Gumba Dani Gyanindu, which is good evening. It's good to see you uh, in Baragam, which is the traditional language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. And good evening, everyone. It's terrific to see you here this evening. Um, I'm Vicky McDonald, State Librarian and CEO at the State Library of Queensland. And on behalf of my colleagues, it's my privilege to welcome you here to the first Game Changers for 2022. We're running a little bit behind time, but I think you'll understand why uh, this year. Um, I also would like to begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. At State Library of Queensland, we're inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our guest speaker this evening, Astrid Jorgensen, founder of Pub Choir and Couch Choir, our facilitator, Emeritus Professor Subi Derbyshire, members of the Library Board of Queensland, the Queensland Library Foundation Council, and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Management Committee and Induction Committee. And of course, I have to also acknowledge and welcome our founding partner, the QUT Business School, and generous sponsors, Picture Partners, Channel 7, Morgans and RACQ, and of course, friends and supporters of State Library of Queensland and QUT. Firstly, I'd must also thank QUT for generously providing the venue for this evening's event. As you may know, these uh, game changes are generally held at State Library of Queensland, but unfortunately our flood recovery work is still continuing. Uh, the good news is it's just gone up on the social media. We'll be opening tomorrow morning from 9am, the ground floor only. Uh, <laughs> um, Thank you. We have a staged reopening, so we'll do uh, the info zone, Kirill Dargan and the Corgan, uh, the corner tomorrow, and then hopefully after Easter we'll be able to open up the rest of the building. But I can assure you that the collections are very safe. I've had lots of inquiries about the collections. Um, but as you know, um, QUT helped launch the career of some amazing musicians such as Kate miller Heidke, Darren Hayes and the in indie rock band Ballpark Music. But it may surprise you to learn that the State Library holds one of the largest sheet music collections in the country. So you may want to check it out, Astrid. And uh, I'm not just referring to the works of Beethoven, although we have enough sonatas to please the most exacting piano teacher. Our comprehensive catalogue transports you back to the 1950s to enjoy such long forgotten tunes as It's Hot in Brisbane, but it's cool in Gadda. <laughs> Along with, I met her on Monday on Thursday Island. And uh, maybe some of these quirky Queenslandiana will pop up at the pub choir event one day. Um, so Game Changers is a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame initiative, a partnership between QUT Business School, State Library and the Queensland Library Foundation. And it brings together great minds from business, technology and the creative industries who've had the courage to take a risk on a bold idea. The Queensland Library Foundation is a founding partner of the Hall of Fame and supports Game Changers and many other important projects and services. So um, if you'd like to consider making a tax deductible donation to the foundation, it helps to continue the work and preserve the state's unique history and culture for future generations. And you've seen some of the images on the screen earlier of some of the digitisation of uh, Queensland's history that we've been doing with the fundraising that we've been able to achieve. And you might help save a song like Indrapilly, the tongue-twisting waltz song from Obscurity. So tonight we're going to hear from Astrid Jorgensen, the conductor and founder of Pub Choir. This terrific initiative transforms a large, boisterous crowd into a harmonious choir over the course of an evening. It was founded in 2017 on the bold premise that anyone can sing. And it quickly became a huge success with tickets to the first pub choir in, in event in Melbourne selling out. Astrid has already sung with hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And when COVID threatened the choir's viability, Astrid was able to pivot to Couch Choir, an online version designed to combat social isolation. But the joyful experience of singing with friends and strangers in a crowded pub is as popular as ever. And recently, over 850 people attended nightly events in Brisbane, which is fantastic, even with the capacity restrictions. I'd also like to introduce to you Emeritus Professor Susie Derbyshire, who will be expertly facilitating this evening's conversation. 
And in 2002, uh, Susie became the inaugural head of fashion with the Creative Industries Faculty at QUT and has also received a number of teaching excellence awards. And more recently, she was the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Learning and Teaching, a role that she held until her retirement in 2019. So tonight's conversation will be broadcast live on Facebook and on State Library of Queensland's live stream page. We'll also be using Slido to collect questions from both online and people in the audience here on site. So go to slido.com and enter the event code hash QBLHOF or simply scan the QR code that is on the screen behind me. Uh, Susie is going to do her best to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, and if you do experience connection issues on our website, head over to our Facebook page to view the talk there as well. And if you're sharing your thoughts about tonight's conversation on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag QBLHoff. So um, over to Susie, and um, I hope you enjoy the discussion and perhaps a little bit of singing. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks, Vicky, and thanks, QT, for providing this lovely venue. Uh, it's, it's, as you can imagine from what Vicky just said, it's a bit like coming home for me, and it's very hard to beat that beautiful auditorium at the State Library, but it's a pretty special place for what I know is going to be a wonderful evening with Astrid. We're going to chat for 20 or, or 30 minutes, um, and uh, there will be singing short burst of singing you're not here we're not pub choir so we're not going to do an hour and a half <laughs> and and then we'll be working through the questions that you uh, submit so please do use the slido use it as soon as you want as frequently as you want if you're not the sort of person that wants to post a question you can also vote other people's questions up so please do have a look at it as we go through the first part of the evening. And, and the voting is a really lovely way to, to make sure that we get the, the, the questions coming through that are of real interest to you. So it's, it's just a lovely way to do that. Um, so if anyone needs to leave, because it is going to be filmed, we have people in the room, but we've also got lots of people at home. So if you do need to leave, can you try and leave discreetly, <laughs> uh, not straight in front of all the cameras or across the front of the, uh, of the room? Um, we realise there might be reasons why you do need to leave. You're obviously not going to leave because we start singing. <laughs> um, nobody gets to leave for that part. You have to stay here. Um, and if, if Astrid gets distracted at any point or throws some strange words <laughs> into her responses, it'll be because she's learning Auslan and she's interested to try and there's certain parts of vocabulary that she's still trying to pick up. So I'm <laughs> I'm kind of prepared for a strange answer here and there just so that she can see uh, what it looks like in, in another language. So <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge to her now to see if she can do that <laughs> without noticing. Oh, you absolute numpty. <laughs> <laughs> She's begun already. <laughs> so, how about we start at the beginning? Um, how did you come up with the idea of pub choir? Was it something that just came to you as an insight, or was it a series of events or things that happened in your life that led you to the thought of pub choir? I wish that there was just one moment of inspiration. Wouldn't that be brilliant that I just sat down and had the best idea of my life? But actually, <laughs> I feel like my whole life was um, a series of events that led me to this. The only thing it could have led me to was pub choir. Um, I have a, a series of rather disappointing careers <laughs> before <laughs> pub choir, which I feel like are the perfect ingredients um, in a bit of a sad soup that actually is the deliciousness of pub choir. So before I was doing that, I was um, I attempted to be a school teacher for a time. Um, I retired after one year. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a little bit of experience teaching and trying to explain concepts. And then I tried being a, a famous singer for a while. Um, but I had a band that was um, exclusively... Um, singing space-themed music. Okay. So the demand was very low, it turned out. 
<laughs> which was a disappointing surprise to me. But then I did have this experience <laughs> of working in front of a crowd and feeling not ashamed to, to sing in front of others. And then what else did I do? I've, I've sung at funerals. I've sung at probably about 500 funerals over the years. When I was at uni, I know the look of shock on your face. <laughs> so there are wedding singers and there are funeral singers. Okay. Um, and I really actually... You'd be surprised, um, but I, I think it's the most creatively inspiring <laughs> yeah. space that I've ever been in. Um, and so what I, what I find really interesting about funeral singing is that you, um, you are not the focus. It's not about you at all, obviously. And so it is a time to really get in touch with your body and your instrument, because I'm a singer, and to really think about the noise that you're making and to be in control of that, to try and enhance the feeling of the people in the room. It's Because it's not about you, it's just about a feeling that we're sharing together. All of those things, I feel like, helped me kind of on the track of, of pub choir. I wanted to teach, I wanted to make music, I wanted to help people have that feeling of being in control of their instrument that lives in their body. Um, and pub choir was the solution, but there, uh, that was a long answer, sorry. Um, <laughs> there was one thing, though, that really changed everything for me, um, was that in 2016, I had a job in Townsville, um, and I uh, had a, the most wonderful opportunity. There was a school, and I've never heard of any other school ever do this, um, where they had a compulsory whole school choir at high school. Can you believe? <laughs> I mean, I had been a high school teacher and you, there's nothing compulsory that you can get anyone to do. Um, but at this school, um, you were forced to sing in the choir after assembly. Um, so assembly is already pushing shit up a hill. <laughs> and then you, you say, well, you have to stay now for an extra hour and sing with this crazy woman. Um, and so... This was the best job I've ever had, really. And this was how I realised all of those things I had been doing all fitted together in mass singing. And it was the first time I had ever made music just for the experience of music. Mm -hmm. Everything else I had ever done was competitive or preparing for a concert or some, some kind of judgement. But this whole school choir changed my whole world view of what music could be and who could have it and who can share it. And, um, and pub choir started a couple of months after I came back from that job. You, when we spoke before this event, you, you talked a lot about how passive engagement with music has become. You know, even, I mean, even to the, you can set a Spotify playlist and it will play forever. <laughs> you don't even have to, you know, like we did in the old days, turn a record over or choose a track. And it strikes me that this is also something that is so, it's such a physical thing. You know, you, as you say, there's no, you don't bring any instruments. There's no real technology that anybody brings to it. They come with themselves and their voice. That, that must require extraordinary mutual trust yours in them and them in you. I think that pub choir is a trustful exercise <laughs> where the audience um, comes along and many of them are non-believers. <laughs> I think that there is often this energy in the air, this nervous energy, which I thrive off. Like, I feel such power when there's discomfort. <laughs> the, the more uncomfortable a crowd is, the more powerful I feel. <laughs> I'm like a feeder. <laughs> and when I walk onto the stage and there's 2,000 people in the room and 1,000 of them look horrified at being dragged <laughs> along to this experience, I think to myself, this is my perfect crowd. Um, because I feel like it is the easiest uh, conversion to give people. Um, because other than what we have all been led to believe in our lives, that um, singing is so shameful and if you're not the best, you should never do it. In fact, singing is really easy and it lives inside all of you and it is... So we've been overthinking it. We've been overthinking it for decades. You honestly just have to open your face <laughs> and push out a noise and it's singing. I mean, it might not be amazing, um, for instance... You know, you've been threatened with singing so many times. I mean, so it, you don't have to have studied music or have some, like, highbrow conception of anything. What I learned taking this whole school choir is if I sing first and you try and copy, then we can do anything. <laughs> we can do anything if enough of us try together. Okay, so here, let me give you four notes over here. One oh. lady's like, oh, oh now. <laughs> We're so soon. So we'll sing now, will we? <laughs> so actually, she's discreetly <laughs> crawling out the thing. Okay, so I'll give you four notes. Okay, so let's go. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay. Ooh. 
try it. Ooh. And there's a group of accountants that I met just before this. And there's just like this <laughs> the discomfort. And I'm like, I'm gaining power. I'm gaining <laughs> strength from this like side eye. Okay, so you have four notes. Show me again. So I find with singing as well, people get so embarrassed. But I would tell you, when you're in a group like this or anywhere in a room full of people, everybody is having a moment with themselves. Like everyone is feeling nervous about their own voice. We are far too selfish <laughs> to worry about what other people are oh. doing. So have a little moment with your own voice and attempt these four notes. I'll go first again. It says, ooh, try. Ooh, keep it going. Ooh. This is your new life. <laughs> Don't stop until I tell you. You'll sing. Ooh, 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 ooh. Try. Ooh, 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 ooh. Pause. It actually is already a bit of a song, but because they're not converted yet, they're, they're still no, on the road no. to Damascus <laughs> and they haven't had the light. Uh, I will add something in, but okay, so you've got four notes each, right? So you just made that with your body. It wasn't amazing, all right? <laughs> but we're getting there. Okay, so sing me these four notes. We'll build it up over this side first because you've had less practice time and then I'm going to do something else. Okay, so you sing. Ooh, 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 ooh. Try your best. Ooh, 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 ooh. Keep it going. Ooh, 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 ooh. This is your new life. Continue. You are. Ooh, good luck. Ooh. Keep going. She will be loved. Yes, yeah, she will. Concentrate. <laughs> be loved. Okay, you can't see at home. And we had a <laughs> we had a beautiful moment, but the entire audience is like head head banging the notes out. People are sliding down on their chairs, <laughs> wishing for death. No, okay, so all, we just created uh, the four chords that are the basis of almost any pop song you've ever heard on the radio. You sing those four notes again and I could sing, it's just a small town girl living in a crazy... Like we could go on for days, okay? Every song you've heard on the radio has these four notes and we just made a piece of music together. Um, you can, any time you're in a room of people, there's a potential choir waiting oh. to happen. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, it's quite threatening, actually. No one invites me anywhere. Um, <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's like magic. You can just use your body and create art. And the more of us that do it together, the more magical the result is. And so it's sort of, it's baffling to me that we've got so used to considering ourselves as only consumers of music. I think we, as a society, put it in a really weird category of skill outside of other things in life. Like if I wanted to be a chef, I should probably go to a cooking class and then I should go get an apprenticeship and I should practice and I should read about it and learn about it. But with music, everyone's like, well, I can't sing the first time, so I'll, I'm doomed. <laughs> I'll never get any better. But music is a skill. Yeah. And I really want to instill that in people. Anyone who comes to pub cry, I want them to know, if you chose to, you could be better. <laughs> you could be better at this, but also you're already good enough. You're already good enough. We can make something together. If enough of us work together, we can really do anything and make a beautiful piece of art. So I can't even remember what your question was, to be honest. Don't <laughs> <Not> worry. <laughs> I think that part of the missing ingredient then, of course, was that people didn't have the glass of wine or the beer in their hand. Oh, yes, and the that lights are. quite a critical <laughs> relax. One lady is literally cheering. Yeah, yes, I needed a beer. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I do love that for people. And what, I mean... I actually am not a huge drinker. I'm, I'm mildly allergic. My mother is in the room. I've got what you call Asian flush, <laughs> which is um, which happens to like a good 50% of the Asian population. It's an actual thing. I'm not even... <laughs> I mean, and you go really <laughs> red and I need my asthma puffer when I drink. So it's like a, a dim <laughs> light thing for me. If I'm having a wine, I'm, I'm somewhere comfortable with friends. Um, but at Pub Choir, just putting the word pub... It's not really an invitation to be disgusting. <laughs> like, I don't want you to come and be munted at the show. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> <Bond> down. <laughs> um, but um, 
I think what it suggests to people is that you can choose your own level of comfort. So we go to the pub when we want to be with friends or we want to celebrate or we want to relax. You know, you can, it's like a choose your own adventure moment. If, if having two beers will make you relaxed enough that you can finally let out your voice in front of other people, then do it, come along. But you can also just meet up with friends and just be relaxed because I think we've got to take out the judgment of creation um, and just make things because it makes us feel good. Like that is a good enough reason to do anything really. Um, and so that's what I hope calling it pub choir is that people think to themselves, oh, that sounds a bit casual. Maybe I will go and have a nice time. And you will. Yeah. There, there is a lovely follow-up question that's already come in. Can you tell when people are just pretending to sing? <laughs> is that somebody in the room who was pretending to sing? Just checking. Accountant. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Look, at pub choir, I would never, ever, and in any situation, I have never singled out any person and any one voice. How horrific. And I think that is something that has um, given a lot of people trauma in their lives, yeah. um, being told specifically, your voice is really out of tune. You are a bad singer. I would never do that to someone. For me, choir is all about us. And so if you feel embarrassed and you feel like you're missing the note, the good news is everyone else here is attempting the same thing. So come on board, you know. Um, so I, I do see some people, well, I don't know if they're pretending to sing, but I do see people come along to the show and not move their mouth at all. And then so I know there's no noise <laughs> coming out. But something that I say at every single show is, until you are honest with me, I will never know how to help you. <laughs> so when you come to the show, if you refuse to sing and make any noise, because in your mind you're like, well, I'll probably be wrong, so I won't do anything, well, then you'll never get any closer to the destination. So if you open your face and let out whatever noise you thought it was supposed to be, then I know how to help you. And that's how we create the thing together. It's really magical when people finally trust the process. There's a lovely quote that Tr Trent Dalton said about pub choir. What was that? Yeah, well, my mate Trent Dalton, the author. <laughs> actually, he Drop came along to the show. I didn't exactly. even try and find him. He, I found out that he was a fan. He'd been to the show. And I talked to him about it because I had never been. <laughs> I feel like everyone in Brisbane has come along to a show except for me. I've never experienced what it's like. Um, and he said to me, it's the sound of people agreeing. Um, and I feel like it's so rare. Think about the last two years. Think about everything we've been through. Think about the internet. Think about everything that we see online and on TV. We rarely agree. And at this show, I don't know who they are. There's thousands of people there. Of course, we don't agree on so much stuff. Um, and yet, if we all just put our little paws in and decide that we'll make something together for one hour, we can agree. And it feels like therapy, mm. very cheap therapy. Mm. Uh, uh, you talk a lot about um, people doing things together and, and we talk a lot about collaboration and teamwork um, in, in work environments particularly. But I don't think that's always what people feel that they experience. What do you, what do you believe are those key ingredients to create an environment where people like thrive and are prepared to work together with people they don't know in an environment where they're probably quite stressed. <laughs> what, what do you think it is that makes that happen? Look, I think there's a couple of things. Um, one, one um, and I feel like it's very un-Australian to say this, so uh, whatever that means even, um, but I think that I'm really good at my job. So sometimes I think you just need someone at the helm. Sometimes in a team environment, someone's got to know what's going on. <laughs> someone needs to be in charge. And I think when people come to pub choir, they feel like they're going to have to forge a new path for themselves throughout the yeah. evening and create a piece of music. I'm in charge. I'll let you know what I need. But then I think I try and uh, I establish that I'm in charge, but then I let go. So I, I kind of think of this as kind of like... Um, being honest with the audience or being honest even with my employees and contractors about what I want and then handing over a little bit of agency. And I think um, actually Couch Choir was a really amazing um, example of what can happen when you give over the agency mm. once you've given your clear instructions. Mm. <laughs> so with Couch Choir, um, it was all online. There's no real time interaction. So I would put up instructions of what I wanted people to attempt. <laughs> 
I was like, this is what I hope for you. <laughs> um, I'm going to sing something and I want you to spend some time with it. And when you feel like you've got uh, your head wrapped around what, what I'm singing, I want you to sing along with me your version of that and video it and send it back to me, and then I will put it together. And that is a real trust exercise for people because um, people had to sit at home with their own voice and they might miss a bunch of notes, come to terms with that, and then send it off to me anyway. And I tell you what, I feel like I had another huge shift in understanding of what music could be for people and who could have it and how we can share it because funnily enough, with our Auslan interpreters here, I, prior to Couch Choir, I thought I was a pretty free thinker with music, with my pub choir and everything like that. But actually, with Couch Choir, I learned that my understanding of music was so limited that I genuinely thought that only hearing people could enjoy being a part of it. And then when we put out our Couch Choir instructions, people were sending in silent videos oh. with sign language. And I thought to myself, I've got goosebumps yeah. on my own story. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but actually, I was like, I, I would have never gone there. But because I let go of the reins and I said, look, this is what I hope for. But yeah. you give me where whatever you want. <laughs> give me wherever you're at and I'll accept it. And I, I think that's what diversity is. Yeah. We can never know everything about the human experience. So when you open those doors and let people in, yeah. you're going to have a richer, more informed result. Like the world is diverse. <laughs> and so when you let them in, you're going to find that place. So in a team, it's kind of like someone be in charge, someone have a vision and a goal, but then give people a little bit of agency and see what that richness of life and experience will bring to the team. And I think it will be all better for it. Yeah. You also talk about optimism and hope, which is a degree, I mean, uh, as well as being very good at your job, you s there has to still be an element of optimism and hope <laughs> that after an hour and a half, people are going to get what they came for. And that's, you know, with everything that everyone has been through in the last few years, that, that leadership with hope and optimism, I think, is also something that people are looking for and respond to. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like I don't. I mean, I've been talking about getting people to agree, so I don't want to say something too spicy. <laughs> but I do think that as a society, you're in a safe place. <laughs> we have no idea who's. <laughs> <watching>. <laughs> um. I I think that our country is sorely lacking in optimistic leadership. Like, where are we headed? We're thinking about now. We're thinking about an election. Um, but uh, where where is this ship going? Um, I really try. I, d I don't think that we want our leaders to lie to us any more than they do already. Mm. Um, and so, with I mean, it's not like I set out and I'm like I am going to be a hopeful and uh, honest, optimistic leader. But it so transpires that I think when I look at how I run a session or when I look at how I deal with people who come to the show or who I work with. I like to think, I like to hope to be an honest but optimistic person. So I think it's much quicker to tell the truth. Mm. Um, the truth is always faster and, and um, you know, it shows people that you trust them with, with honesty. So in the context of a show, like the crowd sings back at me and they miss all of the notes <laughs> and then I'm like, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I just let them know because what's the point in cajoling them and lying to them? Like they sang the noise. They know. <laughs> they know they missed. And so they were honest to me about where they thought the notes went. And so I need to be honest back with yeah. them and say, well, wrong. But now I know how to help because I heard you go astray here. And then I think the optimism comes in that no matter all of those moving parts on the way, I have a vision of where I want the song to be at the end. I've arranged it. I've got it going on in my mind. And I think to myself, if you trust me, we'll just keep chipping away at this. And it might feel crazy and you might miss stuff and I might say the wrong thing. But at the end, we're all going to arrive at this if you trust me. And so, you know, I think honest and optimistic is like the two tenets of what I'm trying to share in the world. I hope, I hope that's what people feel when they come to the show. Now, there's a very popular question here from Anonymous. Uh, what is the most crazy experience with pub choir you have ever had or you're prepared to tell us about? Those are two very different, <laughs> two very different answers. Okay, well, 
immediately my mind went to um, pub choir in 2019, just prior to COVID, uh, toured the world. Well, when I say the world, US and the UK. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, for a choral act, I feel like it was pretty cool. Um, we were on, like, the festival lineup for South by Southwest and stuff. Like, I was like, is choir cool? Like, am, are we <laughs> cool? Um, the answer was no. But um, <laughs> we went to uh, San Francisco and it was our first show there and it was sold out. Like, that, I was like, we are legends. <laughs> We've sold out a choir show in another continent and there was this big line around the block of hundreds of people in San Francisco and I thought to myself, like, is this real life? And then we got in for our sound check and there was this strange smell. <laughs> there was, like, this pooey smell in the air. Okay, nice. Oh. <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, and we kind of were like, oh, it's, it's, it's musty. Like, it's a bar in the day. Like, you know, people just need to come in and breathe a bit and spill their beers and it will smell normal again. And then the smell gets worse and worse and the showtime gets closer and closer. And the manager just comes and taps me on the shoulder and she was like, the sewage has burst. Oh. And it's coming up through the stage. Oh. It was oh. a literal shit show. Oh. <laughs> and... We had travelled across the entire <laughs> world. There were hundreds of people lining up oh. on the street. And I was like, we cannot afford <laughs> to not do something. We have travelled for days. We have been just chipping away at this, uh, advertising it for months, doing so much work. And I was like, we have to do something. We cannot lose these American people that will probably never trust us again. So I went outside. It was so stinky, by the way. But we closed <laughs> the doors. We went out and I went out on the footpath in San Francisco and I stood on a chair that we'd stolen from the venue in my bare feet and I was stomping on a chair and we sung it with no microphone. I taught the song on the street. Everyone whipped out their phones with the lyrics and I was like, right, and I got, r I was thriving. <laughs> I was feeding off that crowd on the sidewalk and we had about 100 people stay we learned a Backstreet Boys song, um, no aid, like usually I have a PowerPoint, there was no aids, they were just listening and learning with their minds. We were all really invested in creating something. People were sticking their heads out of the apartment buildings around and at the end, all of this suburb cheered oh. and we all went to the bar down the road. There were like a <laughs> hundred of us that were all at the show and we just got really drunk that night and it was very dark so I got red and it didn't matter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's it, that's the craziest one. And then almost immediately after that, COVID hit and you had to come home. Yeah, I mean, um, we were in America in March 2020, which, um, and actually it was sort of just before people really believed mm. that it was a problem. Like it was around that time where it was like, well, this is going to be a long few weeks with COVID. Isn't yeah. this a pickle that we're all in? Um, and, um, but we were in America and it was much worse there. Yeah. And that hadn't really come into consciousness in Australia. Like, I don't think that in Australia people truly knew what was going on over there. But we were there and the streets were deserted. Like, we, were, we could walk down the main road of San Francisco, whatever that is, the cool bit, and um, right on the, the train tracks of the main street, not a thing was open. It was, it was like post-apocalyptic yeah. scenes. And we we were like, we, we have to get a flight out of here. And we drove to LA, we found some hire car, we drove for hours, we got, we camped out at the LA airport and we just said, we'll get on any flight. And we just waited and waited and we got back on a flight. And when we arrived back in Australia, I said, I think we should all get COVID tests because we've just been in the bad place. And they said at all of the places that we came back to at the airport and everything like that, well, there's, um, only people who have been to China need a test. It's oh. not a big deal in oh. America. And I was like, no, 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 believe me. <laughs> I was just there and it's a problem. And then they were like, no, it's fine. Go on your way. So, I mean, it was even at that stage where we didn't fully have this concept. So it was a wild experience to be there at that time. But um, I was very grateful to be home. Never been more grateful so to be lucky. back. And is it true that it was on that flight home that the idea for Couch Choir was conceived? Yes, actually, that was a moment of um, was. inception because um, we were really afraid <laughs> and we were feeling really desperate and I think, you know, that can breed some really focused thinking. Um, and I just thought to myself, um, when we were at the airport, I think I saw in 24 hours about 20 or 30,000 tickets get cancelled for our shows back home. We were really riding high. We had so much stuff booked around the world and around Australia and we lost it all on one day and I thought to myself, 
we probably lose the momentum and crump, like this is it for us. We're on, our ho- we're on this flight home to nothing. We have nothing left at the end of this. So I thought to myself, well, is there any way that we could get all of those people who wanted to sing with us to still sing? And it genuinely just came out my mouth. I was like, well, let's try it online. <laughs> um, and Paris, my incredible videographer, like people write to us and say, what is the app that you use? Yeah to put together your couch choirs, the app is her brain. <laughs> she's just like, she's like 20 something, it's offensive. And she, um, she just sits in a room and doesn't move until it's done for days. And she just manually puts every single person together. I mean, I'm so proud of the team of people Incredible. that we have. Like we've had the same people all the way through and we've really, we call ourselves a family swamp band, it's a long story. But um, we, we really feel like a little unit and we can trust each other. And so in that moment I was like, Paris, do you want to work for five days for no money? And she was like, let's do it. <laughs> I don't have a job. And I was like, well, let's make something. And so we all just chipped in and it was incredible. It changed our lives. Yeah. I think it changed a lot of people's lives. I think, you know, we're seeing the images of pub choir and there's a, a huge energy and, you know, but there that's is... Post, that's pre-COVID, that one. There you go. Yeah. But there is something about those couch choir videos that are just touch you. Uh, d- does no, uh, everyone must have watched them. Maybe part of it is the choice of the song and the timing and the poignancy of that. But it's, su- it's tapped into a different emotion. Did you find, were there surprises for you when, you know, you talked a little bit about just the idea of doing it differently, but were there surprises for you? Be- I mean, you talked about Auslan and mm. what sorts of things came in. Did you ask people t- or they had an opportunity to send a message along with their yes. video? Yes, yes. So, um, Oh, well, we got better at it as, as it went along. But um, I think from about the second one in, we did about seven really big ones, I think. Um, from about the second couch choir in, we left um, a feedback box when people submitted their video. And it became this really strange and intimate confession space for a lot of people. So at the peak, I think we had 5,000 people submitted for one song. Kevin Rudd, you know, yeah. all sorts of people from around the... Yeah, one lady Soon just enough. laughed at that. <laughs> <laughs> the thought of Kevin. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, like all sorts of people around the world. So the cast, some guy from Hamilton, the Broadway oh. cast, like heard about it and was like, oh, I think I'll send a video. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, crazy things were happening. But then I would go through like the spreadsheet after. It was too much. We were too busy. But afterwards, I'd kind of just sit back with the wine and have a little read. And there were some incredible things being said. Like, I'm not exaggerating when I say, and it just shocks me to think about it, but more than I could count on my hands, people were saying, this saved my life. Mm. I couldn't even fathom that. I mean, people were genuinely feeling so isolated from each other that just the idea that they were a part of something mm. was enough. Mm. Um, and that's what that's what music can do. That's what the arts can do for us. It's more than distraction. It's more than entertainment. It gives us purpose. Mm. It can heal us in a moment. It connects us. Um, you know, we had people from really regional places who we would probably never be able to afford no. to do a show there. No. And they were saying, I've been watching you for years and now I'm finally in it. Yeah. I'm finally a part of something out in the big city. And um, people were sending it in from wheelchairs who might not feel comfortable coming to the show. Um, there were all sorts of new faces and new lived experiences and the sound was so much richer. It was gentler and fuller. And it was kind of like what I thought pub choir might be. I mean, pub choir is very rowdy and exciting, yeah. but couch choir was the sound of individual people's hopefulness yeah. in every little video. It was very special to receive. <laughs> and I'm so glad, you know, if people felt something yeah. on the way back. Yeah. There's a question or a, a comment about, um, there seem to be a lot of women in the audience. Have you explored the psychology of that, if that's the case? <laughs> um, not that's from Sally. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sally. <laughs> I mean, yes, so it's a, it's a good two-thirds almost every time is um, women in our live shows. Um, I don't know why um, men don't trust the experience more. I've pulled out many stops to try and convince them. If you've been to a live show, I, like, have a whole other personality. I have an electronic man that I, like, I, I, like, programmed this microphone so I sound like a man. I'm like, can you relate to me now? (laughs) Um, You know, I, and it's funny because I think when I see um, 
you know, like male identifying people come along to the show, I think, I like to think they have a lovely time. Um, but it does seem to be a thing that women are taking the reins a bit. They're inviting or they're forcing <laughs> the men in their life to come along. Um, I, I don't know why it is. I haven't personally explored the psychology of it, but I would love men to feel more comfortable with the physicality of their voice and without fail, when the men sing for the first time at a pub choir show, all of the women applaud. I mean, the bar is so low. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like, you just turn up and they're grateful. So, I mean, I don't love that as a concept, but that's how easy it can be yeah. for a man to come along to our show. We're just so stoked you're there at all. So, I mean, come along and we're impressed. It's and they'll <laughs> all sing at soccer matches. I mean, you hear exactly. a whole stadium of men singing, which, again, makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck when you, you listen to that. So it's not as if they won't sing en masse, but yeah. not being directed by a woman, perhaps. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I have noticed um, that there are pockets of the wonderful internet that has given us so much um, where there is a little bit of negativity around some pub choir uh, oh. interaction. And I try not to look, but of course I do. <laughs> like Googling it all. And occasionally I see little pockets of criticism being like, she thinks she invented choir, this young Sheila. Oh, and, <laughs> and it's always men. It's always men feeling annoyed that my choir is bigger than theirs. Oh, <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I think it's an attitude thing. I, I think if men come along to the show, they can see that it's not a big, emasculating, threatening experience. It's a beautiful thing that we share together. And, and you know, the more people the more of any gender we can convince to come along and make something together, yeah. the better we'll be for yeah. it. Yeah. You could throw in some sea shanties, perhaps, and <laughs> reach out in that way. Um, <laughs> You spoke about the fact that the team really has largely been unchanged. Mm. What, what, do you, what do you look for? What do you think that has been the case? What is it about the people that you've pulled together that makes that work so effectively? Well, I sort of fell into them because fell in. <laughs> we didn't know at the beginning that this would be anything. It came along for the yeah, ride. Yeah, and um, just by sheer luck, I have the most wonderful people. Um, so Waveney Yasso, who has accompanied every single show, hundreds of shows over five years, she stands next to me on stage and she reads my mind. I never help her. <laughs> so um, if you've come to a show, I'm teaching and teaching and I'm going back and forth of a song and she's always at the same place as I am and there's no music or anything. She's just like on my wavelength and we have arrived at that place together and so we, there's a lot of trust going on on stage. Um, and if you do come along and you don't feel like singing, just watch her and consider how much um, assistance I'm giving her, which is not. <laughs> um, and then Paris as well has, um, I feel like I'm her mum. <laughs> she was, I think, I don't even know if she was 20 when we started. Like, uh, I feel like I have nurtured this beautiful child <laughs> um, into this wonderful, smart, clever, incredible, capable videographer. I think she's the best in the world at what she does of putting together these videos. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we've got a photographer and a, another videographer as well, the two Jacobs. And, and um, along the way, I did hire one person um, the funny story. <laughs> um, uh, I was managing everything myself for a good two years and it was quite a lot. Um, we were doing hundreds of shows and I was booking everything myself. And then I realised that the show was bigger than should have allowed people to speak directly to me with requests. I didn't know if I said that sentence right. Like people would write to me with very low key stuff and they would be speaking directly yeah. to the lead yeah. performer of the show that they were trying to hire. And I thought, we need some distance here. We need some boundaries. So I created a fake assistant, which was also me. <laughs> <laughs> There's an idea, everyone's yeah. thinking. You can have that. <laughs> Her name was Kirsten. <laughs> Kirsten Aitken, which I thought I created a person, but then I watched ABC News the next day and I was like, oh, it's her. <laughs> Kirsten Aitken from ABC 24. Anyway, so she's real, but she didn't work for me. Um, <laughs> and so then Kirsten was responding to all the emails. Excellent. But, of course, the house of cards fell down <laughs> because I was, like, deep in these lies. And I was like, well, Kirsten will get back to you. And it was me. And then, and then, I, was, and then I forgot who had spoken to Astrid and who spoke to Kirsten. And then someone called Kirsten. I bought a burner phone. Oh. I had a say. Yeah, I know. It was why. Yeah. I really should have hired someone sooner, <laughs> but I had a burner phone. I bought a SIM card and it was Kirsten's <laughs> phone and I picked up and someone said, 
God, you sound a lot like Astrid. <laughs> and then I freaked out and I was like, I'm her sister. And then <laughs> I thought about how many interviews I've done where I talk about how I've got four older brothers and no oh, sisters. And then no. I was like, the, the jig is up. <laughs> and then so that afternoon I hopped on Seek and I was like, I'm looking for a fun person to help me with lots of things. Um, and so then I've also got John who does all of our booking and admin stuff. The team is amazing. And it really, I, I didn't purposefully know this but I think the team is so amazing because they are diverse mm. and they are energetic and they are optimistic and they are smart. I feel like you can't overstate how important it is to have people who care about stuff and who are smart. Like we'd never done a couch choir before, yeah. um, but we cared enough to try and figure it out. And that is how everything at Pub Choir works. We're like, how would this work? And let's get there. Yeah. <laughs> And I think I'm not going to ask this question quite as it's, it sits here, but because you've talked a little bit about that. But I suppose what it really comes down to, the question is, what was the first pub choir like for you? What gave you the confidence to give it a go? But I think the, the question really is, what is it that, that, that allows you to go out and do these things that you, you're not, you don't know that they'll work? Probably not necessarily like couch choir. I probably hadn't even really fathomed what it would take if a thousand people sent in videos what, what do you think that is have you had mentors or what's led to you having that bravery to do that um I mean I can't pinpoint one thing but uh, two things spring to mind when I heard you asking that um one is that I didn't know until really late in my life um that not everyone could hear music in their mind. <laughs> so it's called audiation, it's got a name, and it's thinking and sound. And I thought that music was pretty ordinary. Like, I have always been able to sing in tune, and I've always been able to hear a song and play it on the piano immediately. Like, I can just contextualise sounds. And I was like, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Come on, that's not that good. And then I got to university and I did just one elective. I wasn't even interested in doing music. I was wanted to do other things. Um, and I did one elective and it was called oral musicianship with an AU. And um, I <laughs> didn't want anyone to think I was learning oral. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I, I, was so surprised to learn that all of these people doing music degrees, like they were studying to be performers or whatever. Um, and it surprised me that it seemed like I could hear and understand sounds quite quickly. Mm. Like I, I, I didn't know that that was a thing. And, and it was a real moment for me. I was like, it's rare to be good at anything without trying. Like, I better explore this a little bit more. Um, <laughs> I'm lazy, like economy of actions. I was like, I can already <laughs> do it really well. I'll do it more. Um, and so I, I think that is one of the key things that gives me confidence for pub choir because through no effort of my own, I can conceptualise a song in clear harmony in my mind. I don't know how, I didn't try. <laughs> um, and so like when I'm on stage, I never write the songs down. We've done hundreds of shows wow. and we do a different song every show. Um, but I just sit and think about it. And then I make my PowerPoint, which has no notes on it. And um, I just remember what I wanted. Um, and so I don't know, I, when I learned that not everyone could do that, I think I did get a little bit of confidence. I was like, so you guys aren't also hearing 12 <laughs> harmonies? Uh, but the song will let me explain them to you. And then that's kind of nice. It's nice to reveal to people like what other things exist in this song that they might have only sung along with yeah. the tune. I did have a really amazing um, teacher at university, though, that helped me understand what was going on. His name's James Gaskelly. And he, uh, funnily enough, taught... Um, oral musicianship and a big part of that was hand signs it's actually like a sign language of music um, and so that really changed everything for me as well that you can put music yeah. in the air in front of you and that helps me remember stuff yeah. a lot so I kind of made music a little bit physical for myself using my hands to remember how songs go yeah. And both of those things just kind of like when I walk out onto stage, I go into like a flow state. I never plan anything. I have the arrangement in my mind and that's it. I have no idea what I'll say. 
I walk onto stage. I've said once just recently to Avenue, I was like, I wonder what I'll say this evening. <laughs> and I have no lesson plan. That's why I couldn't be a teacher. Um, <laughs> and I just walk out and I'm like, well, this is what I'm talking about, about having just a vision at the end. And I think to myself, well, I believe in you. And here is what I hope that we can achieve together. And I explain the song the way that I've been thinking about it. And that's it. And then at the end, I'll go, whoa, shit, we've done it again. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Um, I, guess, I guess it's really lucky. I'm very grateful that this is how my brain works. I don't hear conversations in my mind. I learned recently people have internal monologues oh. or like a narration in their mind. How awful. <laughs> um, Just music. Only music. The only thing that I can conceive in my mind is music. I can't hear anything else. I can't see things. I've closed my eyes. I forgot what you look like. But when in my brain, yeah, <laughs> I'm so glad I opened them again. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> but uh, music is the only thing that my brain, it's like it put all its resources into that. And that's all we think about. <laughs> Amazing. But you found a way to use it. What a treat. What a treat. Can <laughs> you believe I have a job? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You might not want to tell us this, but um, what what do you what mistakes or or regrets do you have along the way so far <laughs> that you're prepared to share? <laughs> yeah, look, um, I you did send me some questions. I, I did. saw this one. That and was I thought, one of them. Oh, that's so heavy. Um, <laughs> I mean. Actually, I did think about this one thing because, um, of course, I have regrets. I mean, it's been going for five years and no one had done it like this before. Mm. It was all learn as you go. And so, in hindsight, lots of things could have been done better by me personally. Um, but I guess I'm trying not to feel regret about those things because, honestly, I think my intentions have always been good. <laughs> I hope they have been. I think they have been. And I've tried my best every step of the way. And I have definitely made some mistakes. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like when I look back on them, I didn't have like a sliding door moment of all of these options of the different... I, every single moment, I've been flying by the seat of my pants and I've tried to make the best decision I can in that moment. Um, wh what I would say... <laughs> what I am prepared to share is that if you... Because this is the Business Hall of Fame... I would love to see it afterwards. Uh, <laughs> um, if you are looking at starting a business or you're business-minded or anything like that, my one thing that I wish... I, well, no, I don't wish I could go back in time, but now I know better, <laughs> is that I don't think you will ever regret writing down um, the, the decisions that you make and the conversations that you have, even just small notes. Um, because when you get wrapped up in the stress mm. and the excitement of building something... Um, and then you go back and try and remember a conversation you had three years ago or something. It's really difficult. Memories are flawed. We are flawed. And so if I could give you one, one really solid piece of advice that now I just live by, it's that when you have a really exciting conversation with someone, just send them a little email afterwards and say it was so lovely to talk about you about nice. this specific thing. <laughs> nice. Or, you know, um, send them a little text. Love talking with you about this today. Like, keep a little record of how you develop your ideas and your business because you will never regret that. You might not ever need it, but I think mm. that has been a, um, a big lesson to learn for me. Mm. <laughs> There's also a generosity about that. I think sometimes yeah. people forget that just, just acknowledging that I something that might have been said in a conversation actually really that really inspired me or it, it encouraged me or it just I was, wasn't having a great day and, and it takes a, a minute to do yeah. that but often we forget to do that and then it might even be nice to look back and think I've done a lot of work yeah. <laughs> here are all of the things that we've talked about and all of the growth that we've had so that might be nice too I yeah. really recommend that how much of your success do you think is based on timing I think that's such a good question I think um, there is such a big chasm between success and failure in the arts. And when I say failure, I just mean like when people come up to you at dinner parties and they feel sorry for you when they <laughs> tell them what you do. Like that feels like failure. Like often when you're like, I'm a musician, they're like, oh, are you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> have I seen you on TV? And you're like, no, I just have a space music band. And they're like, oh, that's nice. What else do you do? Like, <laughs> like there's proper job. Yeah, what's your actual <laughs> job? And I'm like, mm, fair. Um, yeah, no, I think there's a really big chasm between a lot of creativity and a lot of projects and people f like you know it being socially acceptable to be a creative person um, and absolutely I think that luck is involved timing mm. is really important for me 
Um, like I said, I think I was good at my job already, mm. but there's one evening that changed the course of Pub Choir's trajectory, which was when we performed Zombie by the Cranberries, because yeah. it just so happened that Dolores O'Riordan, the lead singer, passed away a couple of days before the show. We had the song locked in. Excuse me. <laughs> and, um, and, we, and we did the song that night, and it was electric. Yeah. And it just so happened that a big newspaper reviewer was there that evening, and there were really beautiful photos. Yeah. The video was incredible. It got shared by the Cranberries. It went viral in the old sense um, and yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the okay sense. And, um, and, and that <laughs> people started lining up in the rain to come to the show. Like that one moment convinced a lot of people around the world to get on board. Yeah. I, I, I like to believe we might have got there in the end anyway, yeah. but it was certainly sped things up. So that is incredible timing. Um, but I think when I see a lot of the artists that have climbed that pile yeah. um, to have that success, I think I think there is still like a little bit of a quality of um, self-belief. I think you do need to believe in your own product because no one will ever be more invested in your art than you are. Mm. <laughs> so you really have to be on board with what you're doing. This like self-belief and drive forward to, I am sure that this is good. Trust me, come along on this journey. But definitely, I think for all the successful musicians that I successful musicians I know, they've all had a little moment of timing as well. Yeah. Yes, I think we've all been a bit lucky. Yeah. Um, there's a question that's been here all the way through. So do you have to pay royalties to the artists that you cover? Yes, you do. So a lot of songs are knocked back, yeah. um, either because we can't afford it or because the artist says no. Um, the music licensing world is like the Wild West. If you are a young, smart, legal-minded person, please go into music publishing and help us out. It is impossible. Yeah. It is the single most challenging part of everything that we do. Um, it has nearly derailed <laughs> pub choir shows just on so many occasions because we're waiting for the last second to get that tick of approval. Um, and I question... Um, the systems that we have in place now, I absolutely believe that artists should be paid for their music. I absolutely believe that there is monetary value to art, um, especially if I'm selling tickets to a show on the back of a song. Um, but the gatekeepers of publishing, I don't think, are always best serving the artists. And this is spicy. This is definitely spicy. The um, APRA Performing Rights and uh, whatever that stands for, Association, that collects royalties from businesses and business uh, and uh, venues and acts, they take uh, money off every ticket from a show so that they can give the royalties to the songwriters. I have noticed that they don't collect the information of what music was actually played. So they're collecting the royalty money to give to the artists, but no questions are being asked. In a lot of instances, say, if you run a business, you pay thousands of dollars per square metre of your business to play music, but nobody is asking, what songs did you play this year? Mm -hmm. So where is the money going? Spicy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a, if you're at home, there's like a big... Mm. Mm. Now, in a moment, I'm going to move... There's uh, some lovely questions here, so we are going to go through those, and then we're going to move to what's next or the future. But just as an interlude, I think there's one song that you often get asked to do that you're never going to do. Is that right? Yes. Very complicated one that we all think of as being in harmonies because we've all seen the very old videos for yes. it, that one. What an interesting question that you've asked me. Um, because, yes... For five years, without fail, almost every day, someone will write to Pub Choir and request that we casually <laughs> do Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> at any show. That could have been this evening. Yeah. <laughs> We'd be locking the doors and never going home. <laughs> um, that is the single most complicated, famous <laughs> pop song in the world. It goes for, like, days. <laughs> it is so complicated. Like, I know that we like singing along, have you honestly... Look, I'm yelling at them. They didn't yeah. ask. Have no. you... <laughs> it's not their fault. Honey, buckle up. Have you ever in your life seen a successful good performance of that out in the real world? Like, oh, one lady... Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. I'm so happy for, for you. you. <laughs> I'd like to see the footage. <laughs> it was Queen. 
Oh, cool, I did it with 45 people. Look, oh. I personally have never seen a version that I felt was um, uh, stuck to the integrity of the complexity of the song. We can never learn this in a pub choir session. People would feel so demoralised. I would feel so demoralised. Yeah. However, I am solving this problem. I, well, since you asked me what's in the future, I have this most ridiculous plan because I'm sick of people asking about it and in a passive aggressive way, I need people to understand how silly that request is. So I'm going to teach them that by every show from now on until it is done, I will teach one <laughs> tiny phrase of Bohemian Rhapsody. It will take me, I estimate, three years, <laughs> okay? I've done one line already at our most recent Brisbane show and I unveiled this concept and it took us like five minutes to do the one line. Okay. Like we would not make it out alive if we tried to put that whole thing together. But I've decided that I will show to people how much effort would be required. I'm going to teach it line by line until it's done. I'm trying to manifest Brian May to do the guitar solo. We're going to film every single line and at the end of three or four years, we will hope to have a video happen. that's a every city, oh, every beautiful. show that we've ever done. Love it. I haven't done it yet, but you can applaud the idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to do it. Yeah. You have to do it now. Um, there's a lovely question here about, we talked about hopeful and optimistic leadership, and there's one about who are your role models for hopeful, optimistic leadership? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, there's so many. I, I mean, I feel like I've, what a blessed life I have that, um, uh, you know, like, what a privilege it is to have had a great education and to grow up in the country that I do. I feel like if you look, there's lots of hopeful, optimistic mm -hmm examples in life. My parents are in the front row looking very uncomfortable um, at this question. Um, but, you know, I think they're really good role models of um, sharing, sharing what we have. So, you know, they both work in um, areas of the world that there is not enough sharing going on, like refugees, mm -hmm. advocacy, and First Nations legal services and things like that. I think that they're very good role models of, um, you know, life has meaning when you share what you have with others. I think that's a really nice thing that I've learned from them. And I think that's the same with all of my four older brothers, no sister. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, will that lady ever hear me say that? She'll, she knew, she knew, it's fine. <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, no, like my family is such a lovely environment to, um, you know, explore those kind of hopeful, optimistic mm. areas of life. So, yeah. Lovely, it's a lovely answer. Um, there's a nice question too about hobbies. We seem to avoid hobbies that are pure fun in favour of hobbies with a goal. How would you encourage someone to do what makes them feel good? Okay, let me say this to you. <laughs> yeah, is this encouraging? Um, you are not the best at anything, okay? <laughs> you can never probably be the best at anything. And I think it's a weird obsession we have about being the best. And I won't do something unless I'm the best. Think of how many people there are in the world as if we are the best at anything. <laughs> like, and you might be, you might, like, congrats. Like, <laughs> just so happy for you. Um, but, you know, you might be the best at one thing. And then what about everything else in life? Like, w the sooner we can let go of the idea that we are striving to be the best, mm. because it is an impossible goal. You will only ever fail. <laughs> you will only ever be disappointed. I feel like it's so freeing to just in one moment, and I think that's what pub choir allows people to do. It's like, I am average <laughs> and I am free. Like you are not the most important person when you come to pub choir. It's yeah. just not about you, doll. Like it's, <laughs> it's about us. It's about a feeling of happiness and sharing and joy. And it, people are free. They're like, yeah. it doesn't matter if I miss. And then they really enjoy themselves. And I feel like that is just such a nice, when I see that, I'm like, that's so nice for you. I'm so happy for you. And I feel like, why can't we approach all of these hobbies and areas of life, even at work? You're just not the best. Do your best, yeah. <laughs> but be free from this impossible goal. And then start to think to yourself, what does it feel like to do this work? 
What does it feel like to do this hobby? Do I actually enjoy the feeling of running? <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't exercise. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, like start thinking about that. That's all life is, is an experience. Yeah. Like there is literally nothing else. Just this moment. What do you feel right now? That's the only thing we have. So start thinking about what it feels like and go from there. Lovely answer. We've got a few here about the future now. So being as an accomplished songwriter as you are, they're <laughs> they plans in my the space future. <laughs> but, yeah, well, bringing, yes, resurrecting the space band. Um, pub choir back to the US. So what, what's, what's on the horizon for Astrid? Look, I'll be very honest with you. I think that we have a long way to go in convincing the community that singing is back, mm. singing is safe. I think there was a lot of damage done, not just to the arts. You know, a lot of people have had a really rough few years, but, um, you know, I think we have much work ahead of us. Before COVID, we had people lining up in the rain for hours yeah. and tickets would sell out, thousands of tickets would sell out in two minutes. I mean, it's a nice problem to have, and I'm certainly not complaining. Now, um, which is also nice, there is time for people to get tickets, which I'm happy for. <laughs> no one needs to feel like it's the Hunger Games. Um, yeah. But I have noticed that there is a real reluctance to engage with the creative arts um, after all we've been through. And I understand. Like, I'm not mad at anyone for that. I was there. It's been a time. Um, and lots of shows have been cancelled, and it's hard to trust something's going to go ahead and all of these things. So I think right now we are in building mode. We are trying to let people know it is safe. It still feels just as good as before. And in fact, I think we need it even more than ever. We need to make stuff together. We need to agree on things. Um, that's in the immediate future. During COVID as well, we had this one incredible opportunity. I had this opportunity to co-create a TV show. Yeah called Australia's Biggest Sing-Along. I own half of that concept and I really want someone else to buy it. <laughs> I would love to do more of that because, again, um, we learn lots of lessons through force <laughs> about how to reshape singing and the experience. And it turns out people can sing at home and have a lovely time watching it on the TV. Yeah. We can include a live audience. We can have people send in videos. You can, you can have it all. <laughs> we really can have it all. Um, and so that was an incredible experience that we had making that show, a live show on SBS. 200,000 people watched Friend. on like a Sunday. It wasn't even a good time slot and people tuned in. And so I'm hoping that we can get a little bit more of that integration going on in the future. Um, so if you're watching and you're a TV producer, um, give us an email and I will answer, not Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a lovely, yes. I still think that's a great idea. I'm sure there's <laughs> lots of people here going home and making their own. Get your own name though, you know. <laughs> Don't yes. Use my own assistant. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a lot of Kirstens around. <laughs> um, so, so, those, so you've got thoughts for the future um, yeah. and things that you want to do. As a parting sort of uh, offer to anyone that is emerging you know you've said a little bit about um advice that you would give someone but whether they're in the creative industries or in others mm. what what would you what would be advice to someone that might be sitting at home or here with a, an idea they think is fantastic but perhaps are a little weary of of trying or don't know where to go or where to start I think it's such a nice question and I kind of touched on it before, but I don't think you can overstate how effective it is to show that you care and to be a bit smart about something. Like if you have an idea and you know where you want it to go, tell the person who you think might help you and be really honest. Like it's this pub choir thing. Unless you say honestly where you're at, no one will know how to help. If you keep it to yourself, you will never have anyone on board. Um, and so like when I think about pub choir, I didn't know Paul Kelly, but I thought I'd send him an email mm. and I wrote it really well. And I put some nice resources together and he wrote back. Yeah. Like I just don't think you can overstate how effective it can be. People don't care. Like even, even when you like meet in a networking thing and people are so like, it's such a pleasure to meet you, sir. And like um, madam and whatever, but it's like, People just want you to tell them the truth. Yeah. What do you need? How can I help? Um, and I feel like if you approach your problems with that in that way, like treat people just with a regular friendly conversation and let them know what you're thinking. And they'll then you're giving some trust over to the other party and saying, 
you can respond in any way you want, but here is the truth from me, and I hope you're interested. <laughs> yeah. I think that is just a beautiful place to, to, to finish, Astrid, because I think there is such a, a theme through everything you have said this, this evening about uh, honesty and trust, optimism, just your whole um, manner and the love with which you bring. And for any of us that ha have been in the creative industries, it's just a joy because many of us have had that experience of, oh, are you really going to study that? Oh, okay. Um, mm, and those sorts of things. It's just wonderful to hear you speak about what you've done and so exciting to see what you have planned in the future. Um, and just before Ingrid comes up, I just want to really ask everyone again to just give a huge round of applause for Astrid. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know that one. Thank you so much. Absolutely lovely. Thank you. And I think Ingrid is going to come up now and just... I get called Ingrid all the time. Yes. <laughs> it's my namesake, yes. Astrid and I a couple of times have um, <laughs> talked about... I'm never called Astrid, I'm called Bridget. But there must be like a hierarchy of names. I don't know. I'm moving up to Ingrid. Mm. I am Ingrid. I'm <laughs> 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 all right, sorry, go on. Yeah. <laughs> my name's Ingrid Larkin and I'm the Associate Director of Work Integrated Learning in the QUT Faculty of Business and Law. Um, the Executive Dean, Professor Amanda Goodmanson, was unable to join tonight. And I know Amanda's pretty good. She'll often ring rather than email. But when I saw her, you know, when you see the Executive Dean or the Vice Chancellors <laughs> on your phone, when I answered the other day, and she said, oh, I've got a favour to ask. I can't go to Game Changers. Would you like to? And I was like, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm quite proud to say I'm a big fangirl of both Astrid and Susie. So it's a very genuine pleasure for me to extend thanks on Amanda's behalf. And I'd like to start those thanks with da 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 um, I was at the very first pub choir on the, the 11th of April 2017. I didn't know that and that is incredible. At the Bearded Lady <laughs> when a couple of mates, I live around West End Highgate Hill and a couple of mates, oh, there's this singing thing at the Bearded Lady on Tuesday night. Do you want to go? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am gobsmacked. This is incredible. I wish you gave the talk. <laughs> <laughs> And I still remember most of the low lady part. And as the photos came up, there was one where you see the back of my head. And I'm like, I remember <laughs> I needed to get a haircut. I was like, oh. <laughs> so yes, um, I've been at many, <laughs> many There were so clothes. few people at that show. I feel like I, I haven't talked to anyone that went, oh, Ing <laughs> Ingrid. <laughs> Sorry, do go on. <laughs> Um, I participated and shared couch choir with colleagues, friends and family here across Australia and around the world. It was literally the Facebook or the social media when we were all starting to do, let's catch up on Zoom for a wine and that got a bit boring. <laughs> but then friends from around the world and it was just as Susie and Astrid spoke about, you know, couch choir, pub choir is the rowdy one, couch choir is just so beautiful and the choice of songs and very, very nice. Um, when I prepared these notes, I've make some notes on um, what was, <laughs> and I've got scribble everywhere. Uh, pub choir and tonight's conversation is definitely, and tonight especially, because it was free, so it's <laughs> definitely the cheapest therapy that you can get. <laughs> um, just, yeah, Susie highlighted some of them, you know, Astrid's words on optimism, and it's, you know, much quicker to tell the truth and then people can help you with what you need. So I just love that, you know, having been in a, a business faculty and researched and studied and looked at, you know, how do we make better organisations, I might get rid of some of those journal articles and just say, here's some, <laughs> here's some top tips. Um, I am loving everything you are saying. <laughs> Obsessed with you, go on. <laughs> I knew we'd be friends. Um, <laughs> And I guess on the flip side of that, um, I'm in charge and I'll let you know what I need, but then giving your people the agency mm. to give over and have a team around you of people that care about stuff. Um, that piece of optimism. Um, the, the thing about you're not the best, but I loved you could be better, but you're already good enough. And um, choir is about all of us, not one of us. And just a quick... 
uh, anecdote. I too had a fake assistant, <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like we should leave fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Her name was, and my my friend who is here as a guest um, knows this is a very true story from about 2008. Um, my fake assistant was called um, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was when Gwyneth and Chris had just had... You know, so, <laughs> but I didn't go quite as far as Astrid. There was no burner phone involved. <laughs> it was just this fantasy in work meetings or down the hallway where I'd say things like, I'll check in with Apple. She can do it. <laughs> so Very Apple good. was, yeah, just this fantasy. And occasionally another colleague and I, Amisha, talk about why can't we get Apple to do this? <laughs> so, yes, the fake assistant, I had it, but, yep, you took it to a whole other level. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, thank you so much. So, thank you for sharing. It was a great conversation. And I mentioned I'm a double fangirl. Susie and I, I think we can say we're friends. Yeah. We are. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit awkward. <laughs> <laughs> With a reluctant nod. <laughs> Ingrid who? <Yeah. laughs> so a very special thanks to QUT Emeritus Professor Susie Derbyshire. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Susie here at QUT and she always brought the energy, professionalism, enthusiasm and sense of curiosity that you saw tonight. One of my favourite memories of Susie, um, and I'm not sure, there's probably some people who are there, uh, a big, very official event about digital futures, which was very interesting. Oh, yeah. Crochet. And Susie had the room of about 200 people of industry leaders, academics and highfalutin people. Quite a lot of men. Quite a lot of men. <laughs> and we all, Susie taught us all how, well, attempted to teach us all how to crochet. <laughs> Which, and don't worry, if you think pub choir is like, what? <laughs> when Susie's like, no, in the table you see there's a crochet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, I'm still trying to perfect it. And <laughs> Susie does these amazing crocheted socks that she puts up and I'm like, oh, still trying to get that first up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's, we all miss Susie at QUT, but we're very glad she stayed very connected through a number of activities, particularly facilitating game changes in such a fabulous way. For those of you who would like to revisit the conversation or share it with friends and colleagues, and I'm sure many of you will, the webcast and transcript will be available on the State Library of Queensland and Queensland Business, Lauders, Business Leaders Hall of Fame websites in about a week. Um, when we were meeting before, there's a couple of game, well, there's a number of game changer events that I was recommending to a couple of people. Go watch that one, it's great. There's more exciting game changer events planned for the rest of the year, so please stay tuned via Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame website for announcements in the coming months. On behalf of the Hall of Fame Induction Committee and the founding partners, I'd like to thank again our sponsors, Picture Partners, Channel 7, Morgan's, RACQ, and our refreshment sponsors, Cloverley Estate and Newstead Brewing Company. We're so grateful for their ongoing support and commitment to this very important program. We hope to welcome you all back to another Game Changers event very soon. And please, again, join me in thanking Astrid and Susie. Well done. <laughs>